On November 14, 1998, the members of the Tectonic Theater Project traveled to Laramie, Wyoming and conducted interviews with the people of the town. Over the next year, we would travel back to Laramie several times and conduct over 200 interviews. The play you're about to see has been edited from those interviews, along with journal entries from members of the company and other found texts. Company member Greg Fry. My first interview was with Detective Sergeant Hayden of the Laramie Police Department. Rebecca Hilliker, head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. You have an opportunity to be happy in your lives here. I found that people here were nicer than in the Midwest, where I used to teach, because they were happy. They were glad the sun was shining. And it shines a lot. Think about this climate. The cold, the wind. They say the Wyoming wind will drive a man insane, but you know what? Don't bother me. Well, some of the times it bothers me, but most of the time, it don't. And then you got the university population. I moved here after living in a couple of big cities. Phil Dubois, president of the University of Wyoming. I loved it there. You have to be out of your mind to let your kids out after dark. And here, in the summertime, my kids pull out at night until 11 o'clock. Now I'll think twice about it. Well, it's just close to town. And she looked at me and she said, Who in the hell would want to run out here? And I'm thinking to myself, Lady, you're just missing the point. You're just missing the whole point. All you gotta do is turn around, see the mountains, smell the air, listen to the birds, just take in what's around you. And they were like, nothing but the storm. I didn't feel judged. I felt that they were stupid. They were just missing the point. They were just missing the whole point. It's hard to talk about Laramie now. To tell you what it is for us. Jedediah Schultz. If you would have asked me before, I would have told you that Laramie's a beautiful town. It's cool enough that you have your own identity. A town with its own sense of community. Everyone knows everyone. A town with, this, with a personality that most large cities are stripped of. Now, after Matthew, I would say that Larry's a town defined by an accident, a crime. We've become Waco, we've become Jasper. We're a noun, a definition, a sign. We may be able to get rid of that, but it'll sure take a while. Journal entries, members of the company, Andy Paris. Moises called me saying he had an idea for his next theater project. But there's a somberness to his voice, so I asked him what it was all about, and he told me he wanted to do a piece on what's happening in Wyoming. Stephen Belber. Lee told me the company was thinking of heading out to Wyoming to conduct several interviews, and that they wanted me to come. But I'm hesitant. I have no real interest in prying into a town's unraveling. Amanda Gronin. I've never done anything like this in my life. How do you get people to talk to you? What do you ask? Moises Kaufman. The company has agreed that we should go to Laramie for a week and interview people. I am a bit afraid of taking ten people on a trip of this nature. Must make some safety rules. No one works alone. Everyone carries self. Member Greg Parati. We arrived today at the Denver airport and drove to Laramie. The moment we crossed the Wyoming border, I swear I saw a herd of buffalo. Also, I thought it was strange that the Wyoming sign said, Wyoming, like no place on earth, instead of Wyoming. Like no place else. Um, we drove into the downtown area by the railroad tracks. It still looked like a turn of the century western town. Oh, and as we passed the University Inn, um, the sign where amenities such as heated pool or cable TV are usually touted, it said, hate is not a Laramie value. Greg Parati. I met today with two longtime Laramie residents, Allison Mears and Marge Murray, two social service workers who taught me a thing or two. Well, what well, Laramie used to be like when Marge was growing up, well, it was mostly rural. Yeah, it was. I enjoyed it. You know, my kids all had horses. Well, there was more land. I heard of rent. It's funny how I pull up to the corners and see who? Matthew Shepard, you know? It's a little guy about 5'2", soaking wet, I bet you, up to 97 pounds tops. They say he weighed 110 in the papers, but I don't buy it. They also said he was 5'5", five, five, but this man, he was really only 5'2", maybe 5'1". So anyhow, he walks up to the car window, and I'm going to tell you this story in steps so you really understand the principle of this man. So he walks up to the car window, I ask him, uh, are you Matthew Shepard? He says, yeah, I'm Matthew Shepard, but I don't want you to call me Matthew or Mr. Shepard. I don't want you to call me anything. My name is Matt, and I just want you to know I'm gay and we're going to a gay bar. Do you have a problem with that? And I ask him, well, how are you paying? The truth is, Larry doesn't have any gay bars, and neither does Wyoming for that matter. 
So he was paying me to take him down to Fort Collins, Colorado. About Whenever I think of Matthew, I think of his incredible beaming smile. I mean, he'd walk in and he'd be like, you know? And he'd smile at everyone and he'd make you feel great. And he would like stare people down in the coffee shop because he always wanted to sit on the end seat so he could talk to me while I was working. And if someone was sitting there, he would just stare at them until they left and then he would claim his spot. But Matthew definitely had a political side to him. I mean, he was really into political affairs. That's all his big interest was, was watching CNN and MSNBC. I mean, that's all I ever saw his TV tuned into. Yeah, he was like really smart in political affairs. But not too smart on like common sense things. So he moves to Laramie to go to school. Matthew was very shy when he first came in. John Peacock, Matthew Shepard's academic advisor. To the point of being somewhat mousy, I'd almost say. He was having difficulties adjusting, but this was home for him, and he made that quite clear. And so his mousiness, his shyness, gave way to this person who was excited about this track he was going to embark on. He was just figuring out wanting to work on human rights and how he was going to do that. And when that happens, this person begins to bloom a little bit. He was beginning to say, wow, there are opportunities here. There are things that I can do in this world. I can be Moises Coffin. My hope is that it'll be a better Western. Amanda Grana. Today, we divided up to go to different churches in the community. Moises and I were given a Baptist church. We were welcomed into the services by the Reverend himself standing at the entrance of the chapel. This is what I remember of his sermon that morning. My dear brothers and sisters, I am here today to bring you the word of the Lord. Now, I have a simple truth that I tell to my colleagues, and I'm going to tell it to you today. The word is either sufficient or it is not. Scientists tell me that human history, that the world is five billion and six billion years old. After all, what's a billion years give or take? Now, the Bible tells me that human history is six thousand years old. The word is either sufficient or it is not. Ah, uh, the sociology of religion in the West. Stephen Mean Johnson, Unitarian minister. Dominant religious traditions in this town. Baptist, Mormon, they're everywhere, you know. Not just in Salt Lake, they're all over. They're like jam on toast down here. Father Roger, Catholic priest who is well established here, and God bless him. He did not equivocate at all when this happened. He hosted a vigil for Matthew that night. I was really jolted because, you know, when we did the vigil, we wanted to get other ministers involved, and we called some of them, and they were not going to get involved. And it was like, we're going to sit back and wait and see which way the wind is blowing. And that angered me immensely. We're supposed to stand out as leaders. And I thought, wow, what's going on here? Matthew Shepard came in sitting right, right where you were sitting, just hanging out. I mean, if you want to talk to somebody, you should talk to Matt Galloway. He was the kid that was bartending here that night. You have to meet him. His character speaks for himself. Hey, is Galloway working tonight? Okay, so I'm going to make this brief, quick, and get it over with. But it'll be everything. Factual. Just the facts. Okay, here we go. 10 o'clock, I clock in. Usual time, Tuesday nights. 10.30, Matthew Shepard shows up, alone, sits down, orders a Heineken. Phil Lopri. A friend of Matthew Shepard. Matt liked to drink Heineken and nothing else. Heineken, even though you had to pay $9.50 for a six-pack. He'd always buy the same beer. So what can I tell you about Matt? If you had a hundred customers like him, it'd be... It'd be the most perfect bar I've ever been in, okay? And it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Absolute mannerisms. Manners. Politeness, intelligence. Taking care of me is in tips. Everything. Dressed nice, clean cut. Some people you just know, sits down, please, thank you. Offers intellect, you know, within, within, within their vocabulary. Jane Patterson. Money meant nothing to Matthew, because he came from a lot of it. He would hand over his wallet in like two seconds, because money meant nothing. His shoes might have meant something. They could say it was a robbery. I don't buy it, for even an iota of a cent. Matthew was the kind of person, like... If someone came up to him and started talking, like, he would never not talk to somebody for any reason. Like, if someone started talking to him, he'd be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. He never had a problem striking up a conversation with anybody. Matt did feel lonely a lot of times. Me knowing that, and me knowing how gullible he could be, he would have walked right into it. 
The fact that he was at the bar alone that night without any friends made him that much more vulnerable. Okay, so the only thing is, and this is what I'm testifying to because I'm also basically the key eyewitness in this case. Um, what I'm testifying is that I saw Matthew Shepard leave. I saw two individuals leave with Matthew. I didn't see their faces, but I saw the backs of their heads. At the same time, McKinney and Henderson were no longer around. You do. But now I just want to shake him, you know? What were you thinking? What in the hell were you thinking? The fence. I've been out there four times. I've taken visitors. That place has become a pilgrimage site. Clearly, that's a very powerful, personal experience to go out there. It is so stark and so empty, and you can't help but think of Matthew out there for 18 hours in near freezing temperatures, with that view up there isolated, and the, God, my God, why have you forsaken me, comes to I mind. couldn't bring myself to tears, but I felt the same way. Uh, I have an interview this afternoon with Aaron Kreefels. He's the boy who found Matthew out there by the fence. I don't think I'm up to it right now. I'll see if someone else can do it. So I took off at about 5 o'clock p.m. for my dorm on Wednesday. I just kind of felt like going for a ride, so I, I went to the top of Cactus Canyon. And I'm not super familiar with that area, so on my way back down, I was just sort of picking the way to go. Which now, it just makes me think that God wanted me to find him. Because there's no way I was going to go with that way. So I was in some deep ass sand and uh, I wanted to turn around. But for some reason I kept going and uh, there was this rock on the, on the ground. And I just drilled it. I went over the handlebars and ended up on the ground. So I got up. I was sort of dusting myself off. And I was looking around and I noticed something which ended up being Matt. And he was just lying there by a fence. And I, I just thought it was a scarecrow. I was like... Halloween's coming up. I thought it was a Halloween gag, so I didn't think much of it. So I got my bike, walked around the fence that was there. It was a bucket-type fence. And uh, I got closer to him, and I noticed his hair, which was a major key to me noticing he was a human being. Because I, I just thought it was a dummy. I even, I even noticed the, the chest going up and down, and I just thought it was some sort of mechanism. But when I saw hair, I knew it was a human being. So... I, I ran to the nearest house. I just ran as fast as I could and called. You expect police. to see this kind of injuries to come from a car going down a hill at 60 miles an hour. You expect to see gross injuries from that. This horrendous, terrible thing. Uh, but you don't expect to see that from somebody doing this to another person. The ambulance report said it was a beating. So, we knew. There was nothing I could do. I, I mean, if there was anything I could have done, I would have done it. But there was nothing. And, and I, was, I was just yelling at the top of my lungs, trying to get something out of him, like, Hey, wake up. Hello? But he didn't move. But if there's someone who's been beaten repeatedly, then certainly, this is something that offends us. I think that's a good word. It offends us. Two days later, I found out the connection. And I was very struck. There were two kids. They were both my patients, and they were two kids. I took care of both of them, of both their bodies. And for a brief moment, I wondered if this is how God feels when he looks down at all of us. How we are all his kids. Our bodies, our souls. And I felt a great deal of compassion for both of them. Man, a Laramie man found beaten out on the prey, basically. Later on in the evening, they mentioned his name. I was like, that can't. That's not the Matthew I know. That's not my student. That's not this person who I've been meeting with. I was in the coffee shop. Romaine Patterson. And someone pulled me aside and they said, I don't know much, but they say that there's been a young man who's been beaten in Laramie. And they say his name is Matthew Shepard. And they said, do you think it could be our Matthew? And I said, yeah, it sounds like it could be our Matthew. And the whole story comes up on Channel 5 News, and it was just like, ba-boom. And the news reports kept rolling in, University of Wyoming student, his age, his description, it's like, oh my god. And uh, I, I felt sick to my stomach, it's just instantly sick to my stomach. And I had to tell Romaine, yes, it was Matthew, it was your friend. I'll tell you. 
I'll tell you what's overwhelming. Matt Galloway. Friday morning, I first find out about it. I walk out, go into class, and boom, there it is, in the branding iron. So I immediately drive to the nearest newsstand and buy a Laramie boomerang, because I want more details. Buy that, go home. Before I can even open the newspaper, my boss calls me and says, Did you hear about what happened? I'm like, yeah. Was he at the bar Tuesday night? I go, yes, yes he was. We gotta get down to the bar right now. We gotta talk about this. We gotta discuss what's going to go on. At this point, I was starting to get upset, but still the severity wasn't out yet. It was Thursday afternoon. Rulon Stacy at Poudre Valley Hospital. I got a call. We got a kid in from Wyoming, and it looks like he's been the victim of a hate crime. There are a couple of reporters here asking questions. So we decided that we need one spokesperson. As CEO, I'll do that, and we'll try and gather all the information that we can. And then I watched the 10 o'clock news set. Anybody told you about the arraignment? There are probably around 100 people from town, and probably as many news media by that point. A lot more of the details had come out. The fact that the perpetrators were kids themselves, local kids, that everyone who's from around here has some relationship to. And what everyone was really, I think, waiting on pins and needles for what would happen when the perpetrators walked in. And what happened, there's 200 people in the room by this point. And they walk in in their complete orange jumpsuits and shackles, and you could have heard a pin drop. It was incredibly solemn. I mean, a lot of people were teary by that point. And then the judge came in and did a reading. There was a reading of the evidence that the prosecution has. And it's just a, it's a statement of the facts. And the reading of the facts was... The essential facts are that Aaron James McKinney and Russell Arthur Henderson met Matthew Shepard at the Fireside Bar. And when Mr. Shepard confided that he was dead gay, the two subjects deceived Mr. Shepard into leaving with them in their vehicle to a remote area. Upon arrival at said area, the subjects tied their victim to a buck fence, robbed him, tortured him, and beat him. Both defendants were later contacted by officers of the Laramie Police Department who observed inside the cab of their pickup a credit card and a pair of black patent leather shoes belonging to the victim, Matthew Shepard. I don't think there was any person who was left in that courtroom who wasn't crying by the end of it. I mean, it lasted five minutes, but it kept on getting more and more horrific, ending with... Said defendants left the victim begging for his life. And then, quite frankly, the media descended, and there was no time to reflect on it anymore. Larry Wyoming often called the Jack City of the Plains, but now the eye of the store. Aaron McKinney and Russell Anderson came from the poor side of town. Both were from broken homes and as teenagers had had run-ins with the law. They lived in trailer parks and scratched out a living, working at fast food restaurants and fixing roofs. It's a tough business, as Matt Shepard knew and as his friends all know, to be gay in cowboy country. It was huge. Yeah, yeah it was and the and poor side of town. We're talking hundreds of reporters, which puts a huge dent in this town's population. I am outraged and sickened at the heinous crime committed on Matthew Shepard. I extend my most heartfelt sympathies to the family. Governor, you haven't pushed hate crime legislation in the past. I would like to urge the people of Wyoming against overreacting in a way that gives one group of people special rights over others. We will wait and see if the vicious beating and torture of Matthew Shepard was motivated by hate. Jill and Eileen ended. That we are not a good community, and we are... The majority of people here are good people. You get bad apples once in a while, and I think the gay community took this as an advantage. Said it's a good opportunity to exploit this. Matthew Shepard arrived in critical condition at approximately 9.15 p.m. October 7th. Upon arrival, he was unresponsive and breathing support was being provided. Matthew's major injuries upon arrival consisted of hypothermia and a fracture from behind his head to just in front of his right ear. This has caused bleeding in the brain as well as pressure on the brain. There were also several lacerations on the head, face, and neck. Matthew's temperature has fluctuated over the past 24 hours, ranging from 98 to 106 degrees. We have had difficulty controlling his temperature. Matthew's parents arrived at approximately 7 p.m. October 9th. They are now at his bedside. The family did release the following statement. We would like to thank the American public for their kind thoughts about Matthew, Matthew and their well wishes for his speedy recovery. We appreciate your prayers and goodwill, and we know that they will be something that Matthew would appreciate too. We also have a special request for the members of the media. Matthew is very much in need of his family at this time, 
so we ask that you respect our privacy, as well as our sons, so we may focus all our efforts, thoughts, and love on our son. Thank you very much. It's not pleasant whatsoever. I don't want it to be there. I want to, like, get it out. And that's the big thing with me, is seeing that picture. Because it's kind of unbelievable to me, you know, that I happen to be the one that found them. Because the big question with me, with, like, my religion, is, like, why did God want me to find him? I had amazing hindsight of 2020 to have stopped what occurred. And I keep thinking, I should have noticed. These guys shouldn't have been talking to this guy. I shouldn't have had my head down when I was, when I was washing dishes for those 20 seconds. Things I could have done. What the hell was I thinking? And it's like, you can't possibly know what I'm thinking. You can't possibly know what this has done to me, my family, and my community. That first week alone, vigils for Matthew were held in Laramie. Denver. Fort Collins. In Colorado Springs. Soon after, in Detroit. Chicago. San Francisco. Washington, D.C. Atlanta. Nashville. Minneapolis. And Portland, Maine, among other cities. In Los Angeles, 5,000 people gathered. And in New York City, a political rally ended in civil disobedience and hundreds of arrests. And the Poudre Valley Hospital website received over a million visitors from across the country and around the world. All expressing hope for Matthew's recovery. 9 a.m. Sunday, October 11th. As of 9 a.m. today, Matthew Shepard remains in critical condition. The family continues to emphasize that the media respect their privacy. The family would also like to thank the American public for their kind thoughts and continued concern for their son. Well, there's this whole idea. You leave me alone, I leave you alone. Jonas Sloniker. And it's even in some of the Western literature, you know. Live and let live. That is such crap. I tell my friends that. Even some of my gay friends bring it up. And I'm like, that is such crap, you know? I mean... I was at the Fireside Bar one afternoon when I ran into two friends of Aaron McKinney, Shannon and Jen. You two knew Aaron well, right? Yeah, we both did. When I first found out, I thought it was really, really awful. I don't know whether Aaron was messed up or whether he was coming down or what, but Matthew had money. Shit, he had better clothes than I did. Matthew was a little rich bitch. You shouldn't call him a rich bitch, though. That's not right. Well, I'm not saying he's a bad guy either, because he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time said the wrong thing. So I was deeply moved when I saw this tag at the end of the homecoming parade. About a hundred people marching behind a banner for <clears throat> Matthew Shepard. So when the parade went down to the end of the block to make a U-turn, I went to the other side of my apartment to watch him south down the other street. I was up there in front where they were holding the banner for Matthew, and let me tell you, I've never had goosebumps so long in my life. It was incredible. Just a mass of people. Families. Mothers holding their six-year-old kids, tying armbands around these six-year-old kids, trying to explain to them why they should wear an armband. Just amazing. I mean, it was absolutely one of the most beautiful things I've ever done in my entire life. Well, ten minutes went by, and sure enough, the parade started to come down the street. And then I noticed the most incredible thing. As the parade started to come down the street, the number of people walking for Matthew had grown five times. There were 500 people marching for Matthew. 500 people! Can you imagine? That tag at the end was larger than the entire parade. And more people kept joining in. And you know what? I started to cry. Tears were streaming down my face. And I thought, thank God I got to see this in my lifetime. And my second thought was, thank you. Uh, well, let me tell you, I am not afraid to speak my mind or to be controversial, and that is not necessarily the views of my congregation, per se. Now, as I said, I am someone involved. Let the people in the case. The girlfriend of the accused is a member of our congregation, and one of the accused has visited. Now, those two, the accused, have forfeited their lives. We've been after them for ages, trying to get them to live right, to do right. Now, one boy is on suicide watch, and I will work with him. Until they put him in the chair and turn on the juice, I will work for his salvation. Now I think they, did their, they deserve the death penalty. I will try to deal with them spiritually. Right, I understand. Now it's for the victim. I know that that lifestyle is legal, but I will tell you one thing. I hope that Matthew Shepard, as he was tied to that fence, had time to reflect upon a moment when someone had spoken the word of the Lord to him. 
and that before he slipped into a coma, he had a chance to reflect upon his lifestyle. 12 midnight on Monday, October 12th, Matthew Shepard's blood pressure began to drop. We immediately notified his family, who were already at the hospital. At 12.53 a.m., Matthew Shepard died. His family was at his bedside. The family did release the following statement. The family asked me to once again express their sincere gratitude to the entire world for the overwhelming response for their son. The family was grateful that they did not have to make a decision regarding whether or not to continue life support for their son. <clears throat> like a good son, he was carried to the end and removed all guilt or stress from the family. Matthew came into the world premature and left the world premature. Matthew's mother said, go home, give your kids a hug, and don't let a day go by without telling them that you love them. A moment of complete brain deadness. As I stood out there reading that statement, I thought of my own four daughters. And go home, hug your kids, and oh, she doesn't have her kid anymore. There I am, and I'm thinking, this is so lame. I'll tell you what. If they put those two boys to death, then that would defeat everything that Matt would have been thinking about. Because he wouldn't want those two boys to die. He'd want to leave them with hope. H-O-P-E. Just like the whole world hoped that Matt would survive. The whole thing. You see, the whole thing ropes around hope. H-O-P-E. The day of the funeral. It was snowing so bad. Big, huge, wet snowflakes. And when I got there, there was a mass of people in just black, with umbrellas everywhere. Service invites your full participation. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. And I guess it was like the worst storm that they've had. Tiffany Edwards. Like that anybody could ever tell. Like the trees fell down and the power went out for a couple of days because of it. And I just thought, it's like the forces of the universe at work, you know? Like whatever higher spirit is like that below storms, is blowing this storm. For our brother Matthew, we pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the resurrection and the life. We pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord. Do you believe you're supposed to separate the precious from the vile? You don't believe that part of the Bible. You stand over there, ignorant of the fact that the Bible, two times for every verse it talks about God's love, it talks about God's hate. By the time the company arrived at the Albany County Courthouse, Fred Phelps was already there. You don't like that attribute of God. But so was Romaine Patterson. That perfect attribute of God. Well, we love that attribute of God, and we are going to preach it. Because God's hatred is pure. It's a determination. It's a determination that he's going to send some people to hell. That's God's hatred. After seeing Fred Phelps protesting at Matthew's funeral and finding out he was coming to Laramie for the trial of Russell Henderson, I decided that someone needed to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy and show the differences. And I think at times like this, when we're talking about hatred, as much as the nation is right now, that someone needs to show that there's a better way of dealing with that kind of hatred. So, our idea is to dress up like angels. And we have designed these angel outfits for our wings are huge. They're like big ass wings. And there'll be 10 to 20 of us that are angels. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna encircle Phelps. And because of our big wings, we're going to completely block him. So this big ass band of angels comes in. We don't say a freaking word. We just turn our backs to him and we stand there. And we're a group of people bringing forth a message of love and peace and compassion. And we're calling it Angel Action. Court is in session. Romaine Patterson's sister, Trish Steeper. As soon as I started jury selection, you know, everybody was coming into my shop with, I don't want to be on this trial. I hope they don't call me. Or, oh my god, I've been called. How do I get off? Just wanting to get as far away from it as they could. Very fearful that they were going to have to be a part of that jury. And then I heard, Henderson had to sit in the courtroom while they questioned the prospective jurors. 
And one of the questions that they ask is, would you be willing to put this person to death? And I understand that a lot of the comments were yes, I would. Yes, I would, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. No problem. Yep. Well, can you imagine hearing that? You know, juror after juror after juror. You entered a not guilty plea earlier, Mr. Anderson, but I understand you wish to change your plea today. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Do you understand that the recommended sentence here is two life sentences? Yes, sir. You understand, Mr. Anderson, that the sentence may run consecutive or they may run concurrent? Yes, sir. Mr. Henderson, I will now ask how you wish to plead. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Mr. and Mrs. Shepard, there is not a moment that goes by that I don't see what happened that night. I know what I did was wrong, and I regret greatly what I did. You have my greatest sympathy for what has happened. I hope that one day you will be able to find it in your hearts to forgive me. Your Honor, I know what I did was wrong. I'm very sorry for what I did, and I'm ready to pay my debt for what I did. Mr. Henderson. You drove the vehicle that took Matthew Shepard to his death. You bound him to that fence in order that he might be more savagely beaten, and in order that he might not escape to tell his tale. You left him out there for 18 hours, knowing full well he was there, perhaps having an opportunity to save his life, and you did nothing. Mr. Henderson, this court does not believe you feel any true remorse for your part in this matter, and I wonder whether you realize the gravity of what you've done. The court finds it appropriate, therefore, that sentence be as follows. As to count three, felony murder with robbery, you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. As to count one, kidnapping, that you are to serve a period of imprisonment for the term of your natural life. Sentencing for count one to run consecutive for sentence. How do we move? How do we reach a whole state where there is some really deep seated hostility towards gays? How do you reach that? This is the beginning. And guess who's auditioning for the lead? My parents. Jedediah Schultz. My parents were like, so, what plays are you doing this year at school? And I was like, Angels in America. And I told them the whole list of plays. And they like, they're like, Angels in America? Is that that play you did in high school? That scene you did in high school? And I go, yeah. And she goes, huh, so you're going to audition for it? And I go, yeah. And we got to this yeah, huge I'm just saying you have big people that hold the old ideas. And I was probably one of them 14 months ago. But I'm not going to put up with it, and I'm not going to listen to it. And if they don't like my views on it, fine. Door goes both ways. I already lost a couple buddies. I don't care. I feel more comfortable, and I can sleep better at night. And it's the decision of the county attorney's office that that will definitely be a death penalty case. Part of me wants the kitty to get it, but. I'm not very proud of that. I was on and off, off and on. I can't say what I do. I'm too personally involved. Oh, I believe in the death penalty 100%, you know, because I want to make sure that guy's ass dies. This is one instance where I truly believe with all my heart. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I don't know about the death penalty, but I don't ever want to see him ever walk out of Rose Penitentiary. I'll pay my nickel, or whatever. My percentage, of, my percentage of tax. A nickel a day makes sure that his ass stays in there and never to see society again. And definitely never comes into my bar again. I don't believe in the death penalty. It's too much for me. I don't think that someone should be killed as redemption for his having killed another. Two wrongs don't make a right. How can I interfere if the shepherds want McKinney dead? I just can't interfere in that. But on a personal level, I knew Aaron in grade school. He wasn't called Aaron. We called him AJ. How can we put AJ McKinney? How can we put AJ McKinney to death? I think, right now, our most important teachers must be Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney. They have to be our teachers. How did you learn? What did we, as a society, do to teach you that? See, 
I don't know if many people will let them be their teachers. I think it would be wonderful if the judge said, in addition to your sentence, you must tell your story. You must tell your story. All rise. The Part of me is really grateful. Because I was really scared that during the trial they would try and say it was a robbery or that this was about drugs. So when they used gay panic as their defense, I felt this is good. If nothing else, the truth is going to be told. The truth is coming out. Do you ever try to find us to the charge of kidnapping? We find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge of aggravated robbery, we find the defendant, Aaron James McKinney, guilty. As to the charge Aaron McKinney was found guilty of felony murder, which means the jury could give him the death penalty. Later that evening, Judy and Dennis Shepard were approached by McKinney's defense team, who pled for their client's life. The prosecution indicated that they would defer to the wishes of the family as to whether or not to pursue the death penalty. The following morning, Dennis Shepard made a statement to the court. Here is some of what he said. My son, Matthew, didn't look like a woman. He was rather uncoordinated and wore braces from the age of 13 until the day he died. However, in his all too brief life, my son showed the world that he was a winner. On October 6, 1998, my son tried to show the world that he could win again. On October 12, 1998, my firstborn son and my hero lost. On October 12, 1998, my firstborn son and my hero died 50 days before his 22nd birthday. I keep wondering the same thing that I did when I first saw him in the hospital. What would he have become? How could he have changed this piece of the world and made it better? Matt officially died in a hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado. He actually died on the outskirts of Laramie, tied to a fence. You, Mr. McKinney, with your friend Mr. Henderson, left him out there by himself, but he wasn't alone. There were his lifelong friends with him, friends that he had grown up with. You're probably wondering who those friends were. First, he had the beautiful night sky and the same stars and moon that we had seen through a telescope together. Then, the daylight and the sun to shine on him. Through it all, he was breathing in the scent of pine trees from the snowy range. He heard the wind, the ever-present Wyoming wind, for the last time. And he had one more friend with him. He had God. And it makes me feel better knowing that he wasn't alone. Matt's beating, hospitalization, and funeral focused worldwide attention on hate. Good is coming out of evil. People are saying enough is enough. I miss my son, but I am proud to be able to say that he is my son. Judy has been quoted as being against the death penalty. It has been stated that Matt was against the death penalty. Both of these statements are false. Matt believed that there were crimes and incidents that justified the death penalty. I, too, believe in the death penalty. I would like nothing better than to see you die, Mr. McKinney. However, it is time for the healing process to begin. To grant mercy to someone who refused to show any mercy. Mr. McKinney, I am going to grant you life, as much as it hurts me to do so, because of Matthew. Every time we celebrate Christmas, a birthday, the 4th of July, remember that Matt isn't. Every time you wake up in your prison cell, remember that you had the opportunity and the ability to stop your actions that night. You robbed me of something very precious, and I will never forgive you for that. Mr. McKinney, I give you life in the memory of one who no longer lives. May you have a long life, and may you thank Matthew every day for it. The minute that I walked out of the courthouse, the reason that God wanted me to find him is for he didn't have to die out there alone. Because if I wouldn't have come along, they wouldn't have found him for a couple of weeks at least. So it makes me feel really good that he didn't have to die out there alone. I didn't for the longest time let myself get personally involved with the Matthew, with the Matthew Shepard thing. It didn't seem real. It just seemed way blown out of proportion. Matthew Shepard was just a name instead of an individual. I don't know. 
It's weird. It's so weird, man. I just, I just feel bad for all the stuff I told you, for the person I used to be. That's why I went here to this interview from last year, when I said all that stuff. I don't know. I just can't believe I said all that stuff about homosexuals, you know? How did I ever let that stuff make me think that you were different from Change me? is not an easy thing. And I don't think people were up to it here. Yeah, they got what they wanted. Those two boys got what they deserved. And we look good now. We shot down the villains, we sent the prostitutes on the train, the town's cleaned up, and we don't need to talk about it anymore. You know, it's been a year since Matthew Shepard died, and they haven't passed shit in Wyoming. At a state level, any town, nobody anywhere has passed any kind of laws. Anti-discrimination laws or hate crime legislation, nobody has passed anything anywhere. And what's come out of this? What's come out of this? It's concrete or lasting. I remember one night, he and I drove around together and he said to me, Laramie sparkles, doesn't it? And from where he was sitting up there, if you sit exactly where he was up there, Laramie sparkles from there with a low-lying cloud. It's the blue lights bouncing off the clouds from the airport. It goes, right over the whole city. I mean, it blows you away. Matt was right there in that spot. And I can just picture in his eyes. I can picture what he was seeing. The last thing he saw on this earth was those sparkling lights. Over the past few days, we packed up a year's worth of materials and said our goodbyes. We've been to Laramie six times and conducted over 200 interviews. Jedediah cried when he said goodbye. Marge wished us luck, and when we asked her how Laramie would feel seeing a play about itself, she said, I think we'd enjoy it. To show it's not the hell hole of the earth would be nice, but that is up to how you portray us. And that, in turn, is up to how Laramie behaves. As we were getting off the phone, she said to me, Now you take care. I love you, honey. Doc asked me if I would go strike a book about the event. Galloway offered me, or anyone else in the company, a place to stay if and when we were Turn to Laramie. He also seemed interested as to whether there'd be any open auditions for this play. We left Laramie about 7 in the evening. On our way to Denver, I left my rear view here to take one last look at the town. I will do this. I will trust you people that if you write a play of this, that you say it right. You need to do your best to say it correct. And in the distance, I can see the sparking lights of Laramie Wyatt.